Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. This is my first gosh, and I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to talk about two projects that I've been involved in for promoting um, uh, community-driven marine science education and exploration using uh, open source platforms. So I, I wear a lot of hats. Uh, my uh, formal uh, research is in deep sea ecology, uh, but I also work with a company called OpenROV, who develops low-cost open source underwater robots. Uh, and sort of in conjunction with OpenROV, I work to slow down. All right. Uh, in conjunction with uh, OpenRV, I've worked to develop uh, a platform called the OpenCTD, which is an oceanographic instrument uh, used for almost all oceanographic research around the world. Uh, so these are my, my babies. This is a deep sea hydrothermal vent in the Western Pacific. Uh, and I could probably talk for hours and hours about these pictures, but really the take home message that I kind of want you guys to start with is that the deep sea is uh, it's incredibly diverse, it's unimaginably, unimaginably weird, uh, and it's the closest thing to an alien world that we'll probably ever see in our lifetimes, but it's also incredibly hard to get to. Uh, to, to go on a major oceanographic research expedition to study something like a deep sea hydrothermal vent requires multi-million dollar, multinational research efforts. Uh, it's incredibly difficult, it's incredibly restrictive. Most scientists don't even get access to this. So in the world of open science and open access, it's probably about the most restrictive ecological research that you could possibly do. Um, so the deep sea is really hard to get to, uh, but the tools and the skills that allow us to study the deep sea uh, and really all marine ecosystems shouldn't be. So I partnered with this company, uh, Open ROV, who works to develop low-cost open source underwater robots. An ROV is a remotely operated vehicle uh, with the goal of sort of encouraging both formal and informal researchers, citizen scientists, uh, explorers, and really anyone just interested in learning more about their local waterways to be able to go out and do it. Um, and one of the really great things about the Open RV is that it comes as a kit. So you can't just buy the whole thing off the shelf. Uh, you get the kit, you can assemble it. It's all open source, so you can also just build one entirely on your own if you wanted to uh, go that route. The reality is, of course, because Open RV has the economy of scale, it's probably a little bit cheaper to buy the parts through the company, but you certainly don't have to. Uh, and the idea is that it um, allows anyone who really wants to study the oceans to, to get their feet wet. Uh, and because as a kid, it's also fantastic for STEM education, for STEM outreach. Uh, and it allows, uh, it gives us the ability to run workshops where we can teach students about robotics, uh, teach them about marine ecology using robotics, and really do these kinds of holistic education and outreach programs that involves not just the scientific concepts, but also the tools for science and also the methods that you would do, use to uh, develop an ecological research program and learn about the ocean. Uh, so over the course of the last couple of years, I've been trying to run these research programs uh, around the world where people want them. Um, I did a lot of my research in Papua New Guinea and felt very strongly that I should give back uh, to this community that had done uh, so much to help my own career. And so I partnered with uh, several colleagues of mine at the University of Papua New Guinea and went around. This was really the first uh, large-scale underwater robotics uh, course that had ever been conducted at, at this level. These are all uh, advanced environmental science students from the University of Papua New Guinea. And we went out to a remote field station in Kebiang, uh, which is in the New Ireland province of New Guinea. And over the course of about a month, it was one of the kind of mini semester programs, we had the students build six of these ROVs from scratch, and then they were donated to uh, research institutions and NGOs around the country. Um, uh, since then, we've done similar programs uh, in places like uh, Louisiana. So LUMCON is the U Louisiana University Marine Science Consortium. It's in a parish called Carabon Parish in Louisiana. It's a very uh, underserved community at the very, very southern tip of Louisiana. So if you've seen those maps of the updated maps of the Louisiana coastline that show it having significantly receded, Terrebonne Parish is mostly in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, not so much on land anymore. And so we took high school students from Terrebonne Parish uh, and introduced them to the open ROV, taught them how to build them. And that was really important because uh, in addition to a major marine institution in that parish, there's also uh, a company called Oceaneering, which builds commercial ROVs for oil and gas exploration. And so this really acted as not just an educational opportunity, but a chance to show these students what kind of careers were available, uh, not just around the world, but in their own parish, um, where people who lived near them were also doing this kind of work. Uh, most recently, 
recently I was out in the Northern Marianas Islands um, with a bunch of NGOs uh, from the Northern Marianas uh, to assess the viability of running these workshops out there and see if there was really uh, community interest in doing it and seeing if there were community members who wanted uh, these tools and uh, wanted us to come out and build them. So in addition to the open ROV, um, that didn't change, uh, sort of as a complement to the open ROV, um, I started working on this project called the Open CTD. A CTD is uh, an instrument that measures conductivity, so conductivity is salinity, um, temperature, and depth. And these are really uh, the kind of core foundational measurements you need uh, when you're doing any kind of oceanographic research. So these give you uh, kind of the baseline uh, foundational parameters for a water column or for a body of water that you can then build any research program on top of. Uh, the problem is a commercial CTD costs about $60,000. Uh, it is a prohibitively expensive piece of equipment, and that means that uh, the cost of doing even basic oceanographic research is out of the range of almost anyone interested in doing it who is not affiliated with a major research institute. So we thought we could do this a little cheaper. Um, my colleague, Chrissy Sturdivant, and I uh, were postdocs at the time. We were both ecologists, not engineers, which is important because we had just enough experience to know that it was technically feasible to build one of these things cheaper, but not enough experience to know how long a road that would be and how challenging it would be for us to do it. So it was this combination of confidence and complete naivety that was uh, just the right mix to get a project like this off the ground. Um, so it took us about four and a half years to come up with the first uh, functional unit. This was not the first functional prototype. This was the first dysfunctional prototype. Um, but over the course of developing this tool, um, we eventually evolved into a program we called Oceanography for Everyone. So we had to learn a lot of skills, uh, a lot of classic maker skills in order to build these units out. And so in the process of doing this, we also developed a, a water quality sampling unit. Um, they're called Niskin bottles. Um, it's basically a, a tube that allows you to take a discrete water sample from wherever you happen to be uh, in a very controlled way. They, of course, commercially cost between $206,000. And we have one that you can 3D print for 15 cents. Um, and so over the course of this, we kind of developed not just a set of tools, but also a community of open source hardware developers who are interested in helping us out along the way. And that was really important to making these things uh, function. The biggest challenge, of course, in a project like that is uh, uh, building trust in the actual sensors. So we have a unit that costs $200 that we're trying to have competing in students that cost $60,000. And we want it to be something that scientists trust for publishable, replicatable data. Uh, and that means that a lot of what we have to do, and a lot of what we've been doing over the last couple of years, is taking our units out in the field and testing them against commercial units. So this thing down here that looks like a PVC pipe, because it is a PVC pipe, <laughs> is our uh, $200 CTD. Um, this, everything else around it is the $60,000 commercial unit. This stuff up here, these are the Niskin bottles that um, we have a 3D printable version of. Um, usually CTDs happen in concert, in, 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 usually have Niskin bottles and CTDs, so you can take water samples as you're measuring the water column uh, in what's called a rosette. So our next step is to develop an open source rosette, which is going to be a lot of fun. But um, so this was, I had the opportunity to go out on a research expedition on, on Lake Superior and test our units down to about 140 meters. and. Uh, during the entire time, we fell within 2% of the accuracy of the commercial units, so that was a really validating thing to see. And so since then, we've been uh, sending units out around the world to other researchers to test them so that we can really build a baseline uh, database of, of measurements that people can see and trust and kind of get the sort of scientific buy-in to, to uh, accept that the Open CTD is a unit that you can really use to do uh, replicatable scientific research. Um, in addition to this, we've been testing its viability as a, as a long-term monitoring station. So if anyone wants to know like, what a hurricane looks like as it blows through an estuary, this is a hurricane blowing through an estuary. This is Hurricane Hermine that hit the coast of Virginia last year. And there's a lot of really interesting stories that can be told in this data. Uh, the orange is uh, pressure, so it's the height of water as, it's, as the hurricane is, is moving in and moving a big body of water up 
the estuary. The gray is salinity, so you can see as it's estuary, so you have river water coming out or coming in, and then as a hurricane surge pushes up, the water gets saltier and saltier and saltier. And then up at the top is temperature, and you can see when it rains, the temperature goes down a little bit. When it rains and the salinity is going up, you can see a drop in both temperature and salinity. And then this ledge is probably the most interesting bit of the story because this is the hurricane floodwaters breaching the retaining wall around my farm. And so all of a sudden, you've got uh, a huge mass of water flowing into what was previously a big empty space. And so the water level levels off for a little bit as the water kind of over pours into the retaining wall. And then this little peak right here is um, the water getting into my kitchen. Uh, <laughs> so, so my insurance agent was very pleased that we had a nice uh, documented record of exactly <laughs> what happened to the house during that hurricane. Um, a little bit unfortunate. I, I don't recommend letting your kitchen flood in the middle of a hurricane, but sometimes it happens. Um, and so we, of course, we have a public-facing website for this called oceanographyforeveryone.com. But the meat and potatoes of all of our stuff is on our, our GitHub page, where we have uh, not only the source code and the bills of material and building instructions, but we've been uh, collating and aggregating all of our field notes over the last few years, so you can go in and see uh, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis what's happened with this project, what we've been doing, what the deployments look like. You can download the raw data and manipulate it yourself if you want. Um, and then this is kind of my final final take home. This shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone here. But a lot of these kinds of technologies, they really start to shine, uh, not when they're at kind of the cutting edge of technological innovation, but when the actual parts you're using are, are easy, they're easy to access, they're easy to work with, they're easy to acquire, uh, ubiquitous and cheap, uh, so that it's not really like the forefront of technological development, but rather taking a whole lot of very mundane components and putting them together in interesting ways to yield very interesting results. Um, so that's me uh, in a nutshell, and I'm happy to talk about this more after uh, uh, this session. Okay.